Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to Marion University and the uh, Richard Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies speaker series. Um, before I introduce our speaker, let me just uh, go over a couple things real quickly. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, the uh, speaker series is uh, one of the things that we do at the uh, Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. Um, it is the, our public affairs aspect. The other part of the, of, the, of the center is our academic program in Global Studies, and we have some students here in the Global Studies program. Um, we have a minor in Global Studies that fits with any major at Marion University in the liberal arts and sciences or the, the um, professional studies. And we have uh, Luger Fellow scholarships for students who come in and, uh, and minor in global studies. Um, how many people here are in the global studies program? Raise your hand. Okay, very good, all right. Um, and uh, the program also includes a, a spring break trip to Washington, D.C., um, where we visit the Pentagon and, and the Indiana Senate and Congressional Delegation and the World Bank and, and uh, um, other places, the State Department, things like that and a foreign embassy. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested in, uh, maybe your, your kids or grandkids are thinking about applying to Marion University or interested in, um, in global studies, studying abroad, learning foreign language, I'd be happy to talk to everybody at the reception. It, it, this is uh, our, next, our second event this academic year in the speaker series, and hopefully uh, you picked up the brochure outside, and there'll still be some um, outside during the reception. Uh, all of our events, as you know, are free and open to the public, and uh, next month our event is with um, Professor Charles Strain of DePaul University, a religious studies professor, and he's co-author of a book on global migration and a just response, and that will be the topic uh, in November. And then in December, uh, Senator, uh, former Senator Richard Luger will give his uh, annual Global Studies Address here in, uh, in this room. And then we also have some very exciting events uh, next semester as well. Um, please take a look and please uh, come to uh, as many events as you'd like. Now it's uh, my uh, real pleasure um, and honor to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, uh, you may recognize uh, former uh, retired Major General uh, James Spider Marks from television, from CNN, and I will tell you that on our way in here, he got a call from CNN asking if he, if he was available, and he said, no, I'm not, because I'm going to be here at Marion University. Got a better deal. So, got a better deal. So no, no CNN uh, tonight, I'm very happy to say. Um, so. Uh, 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 Major General uh, James Spider Marks uh, is uh, the president of the Marks Collaborative, an advisory firm dedicated to development and transformation of corporate leaders and their organizations. And um, he actually works on some programs uh, at West Point where uh, corporate leaders come in from all over the country and get training in, in, uh, in corporate uh, executive leadership. He serves as an on-air military and intelligence contributor to CNN, and um, he's on there quite frequently. Uh, General Marks uh, spent uh, over 30 years in the U.S. Army, holding every command position from infantry platoon leader to commanding general. He was a senior intelligence officer for Joint Task Force Los Angeles during the L.A. riots and served as a strategist on the personal staff of the Chief of Staff of the Army. He was a senior intelligence officer serving in the Balkans and also the senior intelligence officer in Korea. He was a senior intelligence officer in combat for the Coalition Land Forces Liberation of Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, and he culminated his career as the commanding general of U.S. Army Intelligence and uh, Center and School at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Um, Spider Marks is a third generation West Point graduate. Um, his, his grandfather graduated in 1909, the same year as uh, George Patton, um, and, then, and served in World War I, and his father served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And uh, uh, Spider Marks uh, graduated in 1975. As a civilian, in addition to his corporate leadership development ex enterprise, um, uh, uh, Marx has led many business ventures, including entrepreneurial efforts in education, IT, energy, and primary research. He served as the president and CEO of Global Linguist Solutions, a private company that provided linguistic services for the U.S. military in Iraq, and was the largest employer of Nav native Iraqis. He was the executive dean at the University of Phoenix and served as the principal military advisor to his, pres to his president. And he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, General Marks has been awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit with Oakleaf Cluster, Bronze Star, and multiple combat, expeditionary, and service ribbons. He is a master parachutist authorized to wear Canadian and Korean airborne wings. He's air assault qualified and an honor graduate of the Army Ranger School. He has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Arts in Foreign Affairs from the University of Virginia. Additionally, he received a Master of Science in Theater Operations um, from the School of Advanced Military Studies at U.S. Army Command and the General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. 
He has three daughters, four grandchildren, um, and uh, a son-in-law who uh, received his uh, uh, MBA from um, the Kelly School of Business at IU. So I guess that makes you sort of an honorary Hoosier. Um, and it is a real pleasure to introduce uh, James Spidermarks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, my, my pleasure to be here. Am I, am I working? Am I transmitting? Can everybody hear? All good to go? Great. Um, before we start, let's all kind of ha have a moment. I hope the thoughts and prayers are with the families in Las Vegas. Uh, that, that violent extremism that we, that we just saw less than 24 or 36 hours ago is inexplicable in my mind. I've seen some horrible things in my life. That's kind of one of the worst. Um, can't make sense of it. I think over the course of time we all will. So I would hope that the best of humanity in all of us will come out, reach out as best you can. Um, think, about being, think about being a glad person. Think about being a good person. Think about being gracious. We've got enough crazy things going on. Um, I spent my life as a soldier. If my language gets salty, I'll apologize in advance. Um, I don't know that I'll correct myself. Maybe I'll be corrected if they're filming this, so if I say something really outrageous, it will be bleeped out. Uh, so I take no joy or pride in that. I'm a deep Catholic, so I can always go to a confessional booth and, um, and make up for that. Redemption is a good thing. Um, so, let me, so let me tell you, you know, I spent my life as, and, and again, Pierre, thank you very, very much for the intro. My dad was in the service, his dad was in the service, so it was a family business for over 100 years. And so we moved all over the world. I was born overseas, and I think at any one time we were in one place no more than maybe two and a half, three years. So my mom had a rule. When we moved into our quarters, our military housing, we could keep some of our boxes packed. And she'd say, because, you know, you're going to get settled. We'll hang pictures. It's going to be your place. It's going to be comfortable. But, you know, we'll let you keep some of your stuff in boxes because we're going to ship that stuff up again and make some buddies and... We're leaving. So I spent my life doing that. Well, I subjected my kids to that as well. We lived overseas a bunch, two years, we're someplace. And what's great about having three daughters, and thank God they look like their mother, uh, they're all very wonderfully beautiful, gifted kids, is that we never had any boy drama in our house because we would leave, you know? And if Ralph was interested in one of my daughters, we'd say, Ralph, sucks to be you because we're leaving. Um, <laughs> So that was a good deal. But we had boxes, and so the kids always had boxes. So around our house, you go into closets, you know, there are shoe boxes, and there's stuff in there, and there are other boxes with stuff. So uh, again, as a, as a guy who was raised by all women, surrounded by all women, I know where my place is in the world, and it's in a little tiny cubby off the master bedroom where I'm allowed to hang my suits. So I'm in this little cubby the other day, and there's a box. It's one of the, I hadn't seen this box before, but I remember a bunch of boxes around us. So I'm opening this box and I'm kind of shocked. I look in there and there are three eggs and rolls of hundred dollar bills with tape around them. And I thought, what the heck is this? I've never seen this before. So I, could, I go up to Marty, you know, Marty and I've been married forever. Marty was an army brat as well, so she gets the deal. She grew up the same way. And so I said, hey, sweetheart, what's, what's with this box? Um, what, you know, I got these three eggs. And she goes, oh, well, the deal is, you know, you've been, you were in the Army forever and ever. You've been in corporate America now for a while. You give a lot of talks. You give a lot of speeches. You're in front of a lot of people all the time. And every time you gave a lousy speech, I'd put an egg in the box. <laughs> I'm not feeling too bad. We've been married 40 plus years, and I'd probably get, you know, I don't know, you know, a ton of chats with soldiers in combat, not in combat, doing stuff. I, I've been an executive dean of a college. So I'm thinking I three eggs, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. She goes, oh, not so fast, not so fast. Every time I got a dozen, I sold them. <laughs> That was the role of money. So I know where my, I know where my place is in life, folks. Um, I'll try to make this quick. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is talk to you about, I, I was asked if I would talk to you about some of the current situations that we're confronting today. 
Um, this is a crowd, what I love about this crowd is this is an educated, informed, um, engaging crowd. So thank you very, I mean this sincerely, thank you very much for really contributing this evening. And I'd love this to be a conversation as well. If you have questions, I'd ask you to raise your hands. And I know there may be an issue with sound, but that's their issue. I can hear you perfectly well. Um, I'll repeat the question or whatever. But if you have something that's on your mind, please raise your hand or just pop off. And I'm used to being yelled at. I've been shot at too. So your comments may be, it may, you may intend to inform or you may intend to give me a hard time. Either way, I'm okay with it, okay? Um, but I'd like to walk you through a few things that I think about and I think we all should think about. And I don't know that I have any easy solutions or fulsome solutions because many of these problems are kind of intractable. Um, I was then asked to talk about, well, if that's, if that's the world we're a part of, this is a, a kind of a wonderful graphic, but if that's the world we're a part of, and it is, um, what can you do as leaders in your community, whether you're emerging on your career or whether you've had a full career, you're still leaders in your community, in your family, in your church. Wherever you are, you are a leader. And how do you embrace a world that is really kind of upside down? It's not been as upside down in my lifetime as much as it is now, although I was very much a part of the Vietnam generation. Uh, my father, in fact, I say the two most influential men in my life were Vietnam vets. One was killed in Vietnam and one was severely wounded. So my dad was severely wounded, so we had dad hanging around the house as a very senior guy for six, seven, eight months, getting himself back together physically. And my bride's dad was killed. So we're kind of a part of that. We're at this point where there's, I've been talking to Pierre today in some detail, we're at a period where I would say that fundamentally America is a very civil place. We tend to be a, a contributing to humanity in ways that are disproportionate to the rest of that globe, in my view. We really are international leaders, and we must maintain that leadership. But we're losing some of our civility, and I'm concerned about that. So how do we bring that back? So we can have a chat about that tonight. So this is the world at night. You've seen this before, right? Um, the thesis that I have about this is where there's darkness there's movement to the light. And the only way you will stop movement from darkness to the light is if you put light where it's dark. Okay? Follow me? So look at some of the places on the map here. Essentially there are I, what I call seven regions of the world. Okay? You got the Far East. Japan is nothing but light. South Korea is nothing but light. But look at that little piece of dark above South Korea. It's North Korea. It's completely blacked out. So you've got the Far East over here. You've got the, which kind of comes down to the Straits of Malacca, just north of Australia. Then you have the subcontinent. Look at India. And then just north of India, you've got a, off to the north and the west, you've got Pakistan, pretty well lit up. And then beyond that, you've got Afghanistan, where we've been for 16 years. There's nothing but darkness there. So you've got the subcontinent. You've got the Far East. You've got the subcontinent. You've got Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, essentially dark, except in South Africa. You've got the Mideast and North Africa, lots of pockets of light. Here's the Nile River Valley, all lit up. And you've got most of Iraq, which is dark, most of Syria, which is dark. Good, good swaths of the Mideast remain dark. You've got Europe, incredibly lit up, beautiful at night. It has its challenges. You got Latin America, again, pockets that define itself. And you have Russia. And if I've added those up, those are the seven, those are the seven regions of the world. So within those seven regions, what we have is what I call a VUCA world. Is that an, is that an acronym that you guys have heard before? Have you heard of that? No. Uh, it's, a, it's a term of art that the Army came up with back in 1989-1990. What happened in 1989? Those guys I was talking with, to, talking with earlier, be quiet. What happened in 1989? 
The wall came down. Okay? It was brought down. It was a conscious effort. They crushed it. The wall came down. Com communism suddenly was in question. And the world changed. And for an army guy, my entire life, my entire life, Vietnam, post-Vietnam had been structured around how are we going to confront in a battlefield, how will we engage with the Soviet military? And then a whole bunch of other conversations attendant to that. Most of the outcomes were not good. But we understood when we had the United States and the Soviet Union in this match of superpowers, what we had ironically was some incredible order to our world. There were rules that we followed, right? Because there was an existential threat that existed with the United States being a massive nuclear power and the Soviet Union being a massive nuclear power. And we knew that we could destroy the world multiple times over. If there was a miscalculation, we'd be through. Life as we know it, done. We'd start from ground zero again. Pockets would remain. Most of the dark pockets would remain. Were we going to get civilization growing out of those dark pockets? Maybe. I didn't want to test it, nor did you. So the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to have some conversations. They were called SALT talks, remember those? Strategic arms limitation talks that migrated into START, strategic threat arms reduction talks, etc. And we've done those. Those have gone through, the START talks have gone through 2011. President Obama had one with President Medvedev, Med, Medvedev in Russia. So there's been a concerted effort between the United States and the Soviet Union and Russia, the Russian Federation, to try to lower the temperature in terms of a very, very volatile world. So when two elephants, the United States and the Soviet Union, when two elephants are fighting and are struggling against each other, one thing is certain. The grass underneath will be destroyed. When those two elephants decide to make love, one thing is certain. The jungle will be destroyed. What's happened since 1989? There's a lot of jungle getting destroyed. Because the rules have changed. The rules have changed. The order has now disappeared. Ironic as it sounds, but the order has disappeared. I'm not looking for the halcyon days of the Soviet Union and the United States potentially going at it, at it. But over the course of the last 25 plus years, this is the world we've ended up with, which is a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. It's what we called in the Army VUCA. You know, if you were to pull your phones out of your pocket right now, that's a complete demonstration of VUCA. During this time while we're chatting, 16 people will text you Three of them will be your daughters asking you to pick up diapers before you go home for the baby. Somebody will say, will send you a note saying, hey, where are you going to drink beer after that boring lecture? <laughs> People are bombarding you as a matter of routine, just as an example. Your life is pretty complex right now. Yet you let others define how you establish your rhythm, your rhythm intellectually, physically. You do it all the time. Texting and driving. I don't want to say what I feel about people that text and drive. I'm, I'm certain we'd have to turn off the camera and I might end up going to jail. But I see at that. But here's somebody who is engaging in two incredibly disparate activities when you really need to be atten attending to both deeply. How many times have you responded to your bride and you've said, Yes. The question is more complex than that, but you go, yes. That's the wrong answer. You know? You, you need to have a conversation. We're in a world that's incredibly complex. It's what I call studied ambiguity, and we need to study it as we go forward. So within these seven regions of the world, what are the things that are, I would call those, what are those existential, I think, existential mega trends? What are they? I think essentially there are four. One is the increased potential for com conflict, the increased potential for instability, those two are different, 
I can have a lot of instability and not have conflict. I would hope that I don't progress into conflict, but we've seen that the threshold has been decreased quite some, by, by quite a bit. Um, also, you have the loss, my concern is the loss of U.S. influence And then the other one that I think is incredibly important, where we've been kind of touching upon it right now, it's the advancement of technology to facilitate our growth, our education, scientific discoveries, medicine, et cetera. And with this enhancement of IT, we have a concomitant enhancement of transparency. Because every time you pick up your phone and you turn it on, what are you doing? You are consenting to somebody monitoring your communications, right? I mean, you are. Whether you want to or not, you will. You are. Somebody is tracking what you're doing. You know you're my age. When I, ha I have a playlist, it's really kind of rudimentary, but it's a playlist. So when I work out, I'm listening to... What do you think I'm listening to? Graduate from college in the 70s. I'm listening to the, the Doobie Brothers, the Beatles. You got it. Nah, I'm not a Tom. God rest Tom Petty soul. God rest his soul. Um, no. Rolling Stones. So guess what else I, I get when I have a playlist like that? You get the random ads because I don't have Spotify Prime or whatever it's called. I go ahead and listen to the ads that are coming my way. So I get ads for hip replacements <laughs> and Viagra. I'm doing okay. I don't need either. But everybody knows, but everybody knows what I do, what you do, and who you're talking to. You know, it's, it's phenomenal. And we're not surprised when all of a sudden we find out that Equifax has a hack. Or you find how many times have you in the last six years, maybe, have had to get new, new uh, credit cards? I mean, what a, what a pain. You know, you just, you, know, you just walk back in going, my gosh, I'm laying my life out in front of you again, and I've got to get another card. If somebody has tested me, and it was an intrusion, and they know, you know where I buy gas and when I buy gas, and they test the system, and then they go buy a ticket to go to Dubrovnik or something. I'm not paying for their trip to Dubrovnik. Um, so we've, we've got a world where the IT enablers are phenomenal, but we acknowledge that we are vulnerable with that. We also acknowledge that we live behind a, grass, a glass screen. When you're online, everything, you are, you're, you're exposed. So what might happen? I think there might be an overreaction where people are going to start more more aggressively dropping off the grid. They're just going to push those devices aside because it's gotten so intrusive. I think there might be a drop in the trash can type moment that's happening. I have three millennials. All of them are married. Um, two of those are no longer on Facebook. It's just too intrusive. And they also, I mean, they're, they're wonderful young ladies. You know, they, they got lives. They have babies. They don't care what their high school friend is is doing at McDonald's, you know, on Tuesday afternoon. Like, why do I care about her? That. It's just kind of silly. So they both, they both have dropped off Facebook, which I think is a great decision on their part. I don't have a Facebook page. So we're, gonna, we're increasingly seeing that IT will give us some immense capabilities and will give you, the individual, powers that nations didn't have 30 years ago. That's just amazing to me. The computing power in your hand and access in your hand allows you to engage financially, to publish on your own. You can blog, you can post, you can do, you can make stuff up. You can post it out there. It's either challenged or not challenged. There's no filter through which you must pass. There are no corrective bodies. Also, there are five domains of war. Space, air, sea, land, and cyber. Four of those are governed. There are laws, there are protocols. International bodies have agreed to rules when you operate in four of those, not cyber. 
And when you look at the elements of power, these nations, these regions, these are state actors. At least we can identify them. Inside a lot of the light and the dark areas, you have non-state actors. And you have the proliferation of non-state actors, both for good and bad. Non-governmental organizations. They're establishing policy for us in places like Afghanistan. You have scientific discoveries that are establishing what we're going to do in our engagements with other, with other nations. So the elements of power, the historical elements of power, of which there are four, there's going to be a test after this. How many domains of war? How many elements of power? IT, we're going to, we're going to quiz you guys. If, if you do well on that quiz, you can access the refreshments in the back. Um, but there are four elements of power. Diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. I mean, that's how nations engage. That's, I mean, there, there might be other off, offshoots of that. And I was asked today, how does cyber work into those elements of power? Is it a fifth element of power? Frankly, cyber exists across horizontally all of those. All of those. I engage economically online. I engage militarily online. Let me, um, let me talk about, so those are what I think are the four major trends. Increase for conflict, instability, IT, and whether U.S. influence is withering or is, is ascendant. I think it's, it's under assault. The world is a better place post-World War II order, which is the world we're a part of. And that, that fundamental order may shift, and it is shifting. But the world's a better place. It's a safer place. It's a more secure place when the United States is in a lead dog position. Nations and others rally around the United States if it, if we make the first step. It's humbling, isn't it? And it's it's actual. In the parts of the world that I've been a part that where I have been, where I've been deployed, I've seen amazing progress when the United States steps up. It doesn't mean they always do the right thing. The United States is not without its challenges and foibles. But when it chooses to lead, we routinely have better results as a result of US leadership. That's why the United States cannot, should never lead from behind. First, that's an oxymoron. The United States leading really puts us in a better position. So let me, let me go through, I think on these, on these two, on this map right here, there are three parts of the world that concern me right now, and I'm sure they're no mystery to you. First of all, let's talk about North Korea. Let's talk about North Korea. Uh, first of all, I think the challenge with North Korea is really a subset of our relationship with China, which we're still trying to figure out. Still trying to figure that out. As a matter of routine, as a matter of default, the United States enters into any relationship in a competitive manner. I mean, that's how we enter in. We're going to protect our national security. We're going to do what's right for us. We're going to do what's right for our friends. That's a competitive environment. And we'll let others in if it works to our advantage, our alliance advantage, et cetera. We don't, or we have to actively decide if we're going to cooperate. We've not done that with China. Right now, we have some great opportunities with China. Now, remember, I started with North Korea, but I'm talking about China. But that's the path toward a solution in North Korea is through Beijing. In the South China Sea, you know where that is, right? There's Vietnam, there's Indonesia, Malaysia, there's the Philippines, okay? The South China Sea has annually five trillion dollars worth of commerce that goes across. Five trillion. We also have oil and gas reserves that are phenomenal. Guess who protects the South China Sea commerce? I want you to feel proud about this. Your United States Navy. You pay for it. South China Sea. Pretty cool. That's what they do. That's what the Navy gets paid to do. That's why you, you have a United States Navy. We could agree to cooperate with the Chinese in the protection of those sea lines of communications in the South China Sea with the Chinese. The Chinese now have what's called a blue water navy. They used to have a brown water navy, which means they can only operate along their littorals. 
They are now a blue water navy. They're expanding, they're growing, they're even building islands in the South China Sea, right? What are they doing with those bad boys? I have my own opinions. But we could cooperate with the Chinese and at the, any navy guys in the room? Guys who've been on ships, okay? We call it the deck plate. Right there, that's where the business is, on a ship. The deck plate, and that's where young officers and non-commissioned officers make magic occur. We could, at the deck plate level, have a relationship with Chinese at the deck plate level and figure out how we're going to do that. We could communicate. We could extend liaisons over. We could say, you have left, I have right. 30 degrees, 40 degrees. I've never driven a ship, so that would be dangerous if I said that. But you get my point. You get my point. We can do that. We should do that. The risks are low, but guess what we emerge from when we do that? Trust. We start to build trust. We have measurable success. We need to do that with the Chinese. If we can agree to start to create these areas beyond, now granted, we trade with the Chinese every year, how much? About a trillion dollars a year, trillion. So we have that element of power, economic element of power with the Chinese. There's trust engaged in that, but there are elements where we haven't. I've given you a suggestion where we could increase our trust. If we do that with the Chinese, we might be able to have a convergence in terms of what happens in North Korea in Pyongyang. That's the point. Okay? China will never stand for a democratic republic on the peninsula butted up against the Yalu River, its border with China. China doesn't want that. They don't, they're not going to stand for it. And we learned that lesson in 1950, right? We tried to rewrite an internationally agreed to map. We were overcome, we were flush with victory, and we took it north of the, we took it north of the 38th parallel, and then the Chinese entered the war, and it was catastrophic. It was catastrophic. And you know the war is still ongoing on the Korean Peninsula, right? There's an armistice, there's no peace treaty. So we're at war in Korea right now. I've gotta tell you, China is not going to stand for a one Korea policy, which has been the U.S. policy and Seoul's policy for years. Over the course of 70 plus years, that peninsula has been divided. I used, as a young man, I served a lot of time in Korea. As an old man, I served a lot of time in Korea. We have crossed the Rubicon in terms of ever trying to achieve a one Korea policy. It just doesn't exist. The distance and the difference between the North Korean and the South Korean is phenomenal. If you think the reintegration of East Germany with West Germany post-1989 was difficult and costly, number one, what would happen in Korea is almost unimaginable how much that would cost because of the, the chasm that exists. And number two, I go back to my first supposition, which is, it's probably not going to happen, and it shouldn't happen. We need to make sure that we tell China, we can agree on this. We don't want to reunify the peninsula. So that needs to take place. The next thing, we also need to tell China, hey, we don't, we don't care about Kim. Kim can be in charge. He can be in charge as long as he can sustain himself. That's fine. He can't have nukes and he can't have missiles, which he has right now and not subject himself to the protocols associated with the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Association Agency, for inspections. He has to do that. And if he doesn't, then we're going to have to have a real... China and the United States is going to have to resort to incredible economic sanctions that would cause him to change his mind. Now the challenge is, over the course of those 70 years, the Kim regime has been on a steady march. It doesn't matter what we say or anybody else says, and inarguably, it hasn't mattered what anybody has done. Just like they say, haters gonna hate, Kim gonna Kim. He's gonna keep doing his thing, doesn't matter what we say. So we have to, with China, agree to economic sanctions that starts to strangle the Kim regime. Now bear in mind, the only folks who will suffer in North Korea if we do that is who? The people, the people. Now, as a humanitarian, I'd say I care about that. 
As a soldier and a national security guy, I say, I don't care about that. I really don't. What I care about is that Kim has nukes and missiles. That's what I care about. Kim is homicidal, but he's not suicidal. So if he wants to keep killing his own people, have at it, man. Have at it. It's very hard to say, but have at it. Because I can't put that on my list of things I care about, because I can't do anything about that. Plus, if I did something about that, I didn't address problem number one, which is missiles and nukes. That's the thing I have to address. So we have to get the Kim regime in Pyongyang to agree there must be some form of mature approach towards your nuclear power. He can't afford to be petulant anymore. Those days are gone. You're now a nuclear power. The United States could acknowledge overtly and declare, North Korea, you're now a nuclear power. Congratulations. You've achieved what you wanted to achieve. Now you've got to sign up. You've got to be a signatory to the NPT, which they were, Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they were up until 2008. Then they walked away from it. Why? Because what happened in 2005? Their first nuke test. They had a successful nuke test. They said, hey, we're on our own now. We've got momentum. We don't have to pay attention to this NPT stuff. So they've walked away from it. So it needs to be enforceable. So minimally, we need to get them on board. And there are ways to do that. I've talked about economics. We really could put an economic blanket over North Korea. Uh, that's possible. China would have to agree to it. 90% of North Korea's trade is from, and largesse and charity, et cetera, comes from Beijing, 90%. China really could flick a switch and dry that up very quickly. We could also quarantine their ports. We could not let their airplanes fly, et cetera, et cetera. So we could do this and be very, very successful. The North Korean people would suffer greatly, and the, and the Kim regime, which has a whole bunch of elites that live around him would continue to protect him and keep him safe. So when Kim speaks, and he's vitriolic in his, speak, in his speech, he has essentially three audiences. One, he has the globe, the rest of the world, and we're all gonna burn, and we're all fakes, and we're all phonies. The next audience is the people in North Korea. He's a deity. He's a patriot, and he's protecting their best interests. So they are, he's a visionary, and they are, they are messianic followers of Kim. And the, third, and the third group are the elites, and the message to them is, hang with me. We're not, gonna, we're not crazy here. We're not trying to take over the world. I'm telling everybody else we're taking over the world, but you guys know I'm not taking over the world, right? But we want to maintain the lifestyle that we have here. We want to stay in power. You know, the largest inventory, it's a military term, the largest number of Mercedes-Benz in the world are in Pyongyang. I can't, I can't figure it out. So, the elites are doing well. Kim's doing well. He's a deity. Wonderful to be Kim. He just needs some things around him that measure and moderate his behavior. So we have diplomatic things we can do with North Korea, too. The war is still ongoing. We could end the war. We could say, let's have a peace treaty. That makes me want to throw up in my mouth. I'm not in favor of that, but that might be a diplomatic move that we have to take. The United Nations would have to approve that. That's a United Nations theater of war, Korea's. But we could end the war. We could also recognize Pyongyang. We don't recognize Pyongyang. We do it through another party. So we could recognize them. That gives Kim some incentive as well. He wants to be, he wants legitimacy, and he's achieved legitimacy because he's crawled up onto the table that has the community of nations around it, and he's elbowed a bunch of people, and he squat right in the middle of it, and he says, I've got nukes, you better pay attention to me. And I'm developing missiles, and I, I'm doing okay. So you better pay attention. We can say, yeah, you're right. Have a seat. Join the community of nations. We'll recognize you. You're now a big guy. Those are things we haven't tried yet. Secretary Tillerson is having direct communications with North Korea right now. We'll see how that goes. Again, I'm not sanguine that it will be a real positive outcome, but I'm also not sanguine that there's any solution vis-a-vis -vis North Korea 
that is anything other than a half a loaf. There's no comprehensive solution. There's no fulsome answer that would make us all feel better. I think there has to be a lot. We are going to, I think ultimately, we are going to acknowledge North Korea as a nuclear power. Kim will remain in place. There will not be a war on the peninsula, I can guarantee you that. The devastation in Seoul would be catastrophic. That won't happen. We will do everything in our power to prevent that from happening. Economic, diplomatic efforts to alter the dynamic and the, the calculus is what's in place right now. I told the story earlier today when we lived in Seoul. On one of my assignments, I went over there and I could take the whole family, so I took the whole family. We get off the airplane, the first place we go is we get, again, three daughters. At the time, I had a sixth grader, a senior, and a, one going off to college. We were all issued protective masks. So I had a little baby sixth grader protective mask. You know, you open the front door, you got the hooks for your jackets. We had hooks for protective masks. Everybody's name underneath it. We put little marks underneath it, you know. Claire's mask it was kind of little, you know. Her sister's masks were there. And we had to go through drills all the time. So my 29-year-old, Claire, who was a sixth grader at the time, she can still go through all the procedures of masking. She was never in the military. She's, she's, pretty, she's pretty much an anal retentive young lady. But um, So that's North Korea. Any thoughts or any other? Yes, sir. Where does the childish play between Kim and our president? Yeah, um, well, Kim is a master at rhetoric. Um, my view is what the president has said is not, our president has said, is not particularly helpful, but it's not relevant. In other words, why jump into this pool of vitriol and rhetoric when the North Koreans do that far better than anybody else, our president didn't need to jump into it, but he did, so he's in there. But my view is that doesn't accelerate anything. As a result of rhetoric, there has been no additional threat that has appeared on the peninsula. So I look at this and I breathe through my nose. I go, God, I wish it wouldn't happen, but it happened. But nothing's, the dynamic has not changed. Make sense? Yes, sir. And I'm sorry, what's the second part? And chase the nuclear entry process. In other words, how many people are going to use North Korea as a role model? Um, you know, that's a really good question. We, North Korea has used others as, as role models. For example, Libya. What did Gaddafi do? After we invaded Iraq, what did Gaddafi do? He, he, that's right, he got rid of all of his chemicals. All His entire enterprise just went away, he put his hands up, and he said, come inspect me. I want to be a good guy. And then what happened? He got shot in the face. And what do we have in Libya? More, more ungoverned space. Ungoverned space. Um, nations don't necessarily have to be, Marx's view of the world, nations don't necessarily have to be on a nuclear path uh, to achieve a level of assurance that they're not going to be threatened. You don't necessarily have to have a nuke and everybody pays attention to you or everybody leaves you alone. And the transference of that technology, albeit it's in place in North Korea, it has, those rat lines as we call them, have been in place for decades. And those have been established for decades. So it's not an easy task to just simply somebody step up and say, I want to be a nuclear power and this is what's going to happen. I think there would be enough, there would be enough indicators. If that were to happen, enough dust would be kicked up, we'd be able to see it, we'd be able to interrupt it. That's, that's my view of it. Your body language doesn't tell me I answered your question. Yeah, well, I, again, the point is there are steps you got to go through. And you're right, that doesn't mean that the fact that somebody's going to detect or collect intelligence that would then, you could then discern what the next move is going to be and that this is a precursor to a nuclear capability isn't necessarily an impediment. I would say that North Korea would be where they are. North Korea, yeah, that's well, exactly correct. We've had a, a policy of strategic patience with North Korea, and we've primarily been concerned with North Korea relative to its ground capability, which is the fourth largest military in the world. Huge, huge. Anything else on North Korea? Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Or yeah, what? I'm sorry. Yeah. I think the big difference between Libya and North Korea 
Korea has to be that Libya didn't have a big buddy China sitting next to them, keeping it safe. And I don't think too many countries do. But what, how does this new thing that we just heard about two days ago? Yeah, the, the fact that over the course of, let me take a step back, over the course of decades, Russia's influence over Pyongyang has atrophied. No, no, it's, it's atrophied. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of become a null set. The institution of that is simply an effort to increase Russia's ability to engage with Pyongyang. My con I mean, that's, that's, that's a very simple answer. What's being transmitted, who knows what. My view of that is, sadly, Putin has now, based on the dynamic that exists in North Korea specifically, can now become a global peacemaker, which I... It's the height of irony, isn't it? <laughs> but I mean, he can be, because the United States is engaged, China's engaged. Who's that third party that's out there overwatching, can be unbiased, can, can provide a filter toward the communications among all those parties? Russia. Russia's a part of the discussion. You know, the six party talks include Russia. But they've essentially been out of the picture. Now they're, I think, sadly, they're back, back in it. Yeah, yes? If, uh, if the TPP trade agreement, if that had gone forward, would that have given the United States increased leverage over China and thereby the I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about the TP, TTP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. I just simply don't. Um, all I do know is that China unabashedly is a really good economic cheat. Um, international, inter, you know, intellectual property is a matter of routine, is hijacked and stolen. Um, they don't follow the rules. So fundamentally what we have to be able to do, I think, with China is establish, again, some very narrowly defined opportunities for us to work together, whether it's someplace else to build trust or whether it's relative to North Korea. But again, bear in mind, China will always embrace the notion that there will be a buffer between South Korea and China that has a regime that allows Beijing an opportunity to exercise some control. And isn't Kim pretty brilliant? Kim doesn't have a succession plan, does he? Because he's killed all his potential successors. That makes it a little bit dangerous. For us, not for him. Because Beijing right now has to kind of keep him in place. Uh, let, me, let me move on. I would say the, the, sec the second thing, we've got North Korea, and that becomes one of those where, North Korea is one of those that doesn't keep you up at night, but every morning you should check what's happening <laughs> relative to North Korea. Um, and we have a military that's, when, when I, all the times I was there, what we did in, in Korea was, our mantra was fight tonight. So we literally were deployed in positions where we could engage. So preparedness is at the very highest level. So I, I would want everybody to understand that about our military posture in North Korea. And then afterwards I can talk to you about a whole bunch of stuff, not classified, not classified. I still have a security clearance, but I can talk to you about a whole bunch of stuff. If I talk, if I start speaking pig Latin, I'm getting into classified stuff, okay? Um, the next thing, so we're talking about North Korea. Let's talk about um, ISIS. ISIS is simply the creation of a bunch of mistakes that we made. I was the senior intelligence guy when we went to war in Iraq. There's a lot that I did not get. There's a lot that I challenged. There's a lot that, I was a senior intel guy, so I take ownership of that. There's a lot that I did not get. What happened is that we disbanded the Iraqi military. Once we got in there, we said, if you're in the Iraqi military and you're still alive, you're out of a job. Which is a complete antithesis of what we did post-World War II, where we kept as many Nazis in uniform and changed their uniforms started to work with them so we could run the trains, we could deliver mail, we could start to try to rebuild. We didn't do that in Iraq. We got rid of the military. The core of ISIS is aggrieved former military folks who were Ba'athists working for Saddam. 
That's the bottom line. So when you look at ISIS, when you look at ISIS as a terrorist organization, it's a terrorist organization with some incredible capabilities for organization and deliverance of military capabilities. Yes, sir. If ISIS is mainly old bath officers, does that mean that most of ISIS uh, brass, so to speak, is uh, not an Islamic fundamentalist? They're just a hothead? No, because look how long that's been in place. The, the core, the core, the guys that were making, the, that makes the machinery run, were former Baathists. Would you repeat the question? The, the question was, is if the core of ISIS is Baathists, are they really extremist Islamists? Or are they just hotheads, I think is the term you use. Uh, can I just, uh, we actually, it should be working, but if you could Hello? Yes, it does work. Oh, perfect. So push, push the button where it says push and hold it down when you're asking a question and then let go. Perfect. Last time it push to talk. <laughs> it's magical. Perfect. So, yeah, yeah so my, my view is the core were Bathus, and over the course of time, they've embraced whatever ideology they've embraced. Yeah, oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ISIS, my concern is ISIS, if what we have done successfully, the United States and some coalition partners have done quite successfully, is we've taken their geographic caliphate and we've kind of kept it in place. We've made it smaller. It still exists. But what has happened is that is only a piece of their caliphate. They now have what I would call a, is a virtual caliphate. It's a very cynical way to recruit online. I would also suggest to you the notion of a lone wolf. Scratch that from your lexicon. There's no such thing really as a lone wolf. I can go online and I can find a network. I can find a community of guys who will, of folks who will inspire me. I may act alone, but I haven't really educated myself or trained myself alone. You're really a part of a larger organization. ISIS is an intergenerational fight. My grandchildren will be confronted with this threat when they're older. It will be something they'll, they'll be talking about. And I hope I'm dead wrong on that. But this is not dissimilar to our Cold War. It's very much a, what I call a continual state of conflict over, over the course of the next few decades. We're gonna have folks in combat, friends and allies, and US soldiers and Marines and service members going after those within this, what I call, violent extremist groups, however they expose themselves, they will continue, we, they will continue to present themselves as targets. Of the entire budget that the United States allocates to what's called CVE, count, countering violent extremism, 98% of that bucket of money goes toward identifying targeting and slaughtering terrorists. I use the word slaughter because we rip them apart. 2% goes toward education, which gets upstream, hopefully convincing folks you don't want to jump in that bucket. Because I just told you what happens when you get in that bucket. It's a bad outcome for you. Now you may be able to accomplish a few things that are, allow you to meet your maker a heck of a lot quicker, but if you get into that bucket, we're going to find you, we're going to get rid of you. What we need to do, and that's disproportionate in my mind, and I'm a guy who spent his life identifying targets to be broken. I think we need, disproportionately, we need to get more money out of that bucket, decrease the amount of money we spend on execution, execution of tasks, and get it upstream on education and training. We have to convince those that are vulnerable to this ideology, which is a form of extremism that I can't describe, that that's not really what you want to do. That's not what you want to do. But we're making it clear that if you choose that path, that's where you end up. You know what the IDF does, the Israeli Defense Force? Iranian kids that want to study in STEM, that want to be nuclear physicists, guess what happens to them? If they declare that and they go start going to school, they're gonna get shot in the head. I hope you're glad you, I heard, you heard me say that. These are the guys that are building nuclear weapons that want to wipe Israel off the face of the globe. And Israel's saying, we're not going to stand for that. I'm not trying to be flippant here. And that's not classified. But that's, a, that's 
There's a bunch of darkness in that part of the world. And Israel has survived for over 4,000 years with everybody around it who wants to kill it. Wants to wipe it off the face of the globe. And they've hung in there saying, no, no, no. And they've gone too far in many cases. In many cases, they've gone too far. They are survivors. So that's what happens. So we've got, to, we've got to be able to get upstream and say, guys, don't get into that bucket. Bad things happen when you get into that bucket. And let me explain to you what alternatives might look like. ISIS is existential. It can destroy the, the type of people we are. And when they put you in those circumstances, humanity better raise its head, but would also be, better be able to protect our families, our way of life, our democracy, what we hold dear and not stand for that. But we can't allow ourselves to get into that bucket with them. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, any questions on that? Any questions on that? Sir? Sir, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Use your speaker. Use your speaker. That? Is there a difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS? Um, yes, there is. Yeah, ISIS is an offshoot. ISIS is, a, is an offshoot. ISIS is going to be, there will be an ISIS version 2, and it's going to be called the successor ISIS or something. You know what I mean? Seriously. ISIS is simply a conventional, is an organization that was spun out of, um, as I described, an exigency that, that could be used to their advantage that doesn't necessarily have a clear chain of command relative to Al-Qaeda. Taliban's local to Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is, is a broad Islamist, violent, extremist group. ISIS is one of those. What's their overall goal? I'm sorry? What's their overall goal? ISIS? Yeah, I mean, they, they don't want to become a country. Yeah, they do. They want to yeah, yeah, that's a caliphate. Yeah, they want to create a caliphate. They want that entire thing to be under the rule of Islam, that. We don't want that, yeah. So it's, it's very aspirational, and they're having a tough go, which is great. Um, but that is the no fooling result that they're looking for. Yes, sir? Their central command is having a tough go, but they aren't they not dispersed? Use your, Use your mic. mic. Use your mic. Yeah, make sure people behind you. Okay. Their central command may be uh, centralized. Oh, down here. Down below. Okay. Their central command may be centralized, but their their advocates are in, are dispersed throughout the world. So how do you how do you address that, or how is it addressed? Yeah. Well, that's that is their well. What you do is law enforcement locally has to be able to identify what that looks like. There are pockets of followers that exist in every corner of the United States, as well as a whole bunch in Europe and elsewhere. I mean, where, wherever there's an inspiration, a pocket can grow up, and if there's a way that they can achieve some local success, they will attribute it straight back to ISIS, although the ISIS uh, Baghdadi, who is really the acknowledged leader of ISIS, may be dead, may be alive. Apparently there was an audible, uh, an audio tape that was just released, attributed to him. I. Our intelligence community says no reason to believe it's not him. We thought we thought we got him, and then the Russians thought they got him. The guy's got nine lives. Um, so it's it's an ideology that has more to do with something that's inspirational locally, and how can you build upon that where you are? And it truly is an it's an ideology. Think of it. I, I hate to draw the comparison, but Christianity. Who's in charge of Christianity? whole bunch of folks, right? I looked to Rome, and I didn't always look to Rome. I'm a convert, because I married a Catholic, okay? So I'm a better Catholic than I think she is. Um, <laughs> although I have a, a nephew who's a priest. It's pretty cool. So my point is, who inspires ISIS? Is it Baghdadi? Kind of not. It's the ideology of creating a caliphate and having the Quran as the book that guides what it is important to you and the type of life you want to live. And so everything you do, everything you do is repugnant to those that are following it. You are all targets. And there's no discussion. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. Again, you're talking to a guy who 
who spent his life digging wells for them, building schools for them, cleaning their teeth, building hospitals, laying down roads, creating markets, and they want to kill me. And they've been successful, at, sadly, killing Americans who do that and try to create safe havens, safe havens for that to take place. Spider? Yes. Um, I like the appeal of the moving some money out of blowing people up in a bad basket through education, but practically help me understand how that works. What's the message, what's delivery mode, and what's its efficacy? Because it seems like someone that's open to that is probably hard to reach and hard to convince. No, you're right. Um, the efficacy is always difficult when you're talking about stroking a check by the U.S. government and putting it against some programmatic and how you know whether you're achieving that level of success. Um, because it could be a real negative. It, it could, you know, it could be a discussion about how, it could be, really, it could be a really bad discussion. Like wasteful governments. Well, it's wasteful government spending and then against what criteria? You know, how many, how many people are, have we converted? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. We want to convert them from going down that path. We want to keep them from going on this path. I think that's why I think it's intergenerational. I don't know that it's, there, there is no immediate measurement that would give us a sense of comfort. What has given us a sense of comfort is the physical caliphate, which has, we've been able to shrink over the course of years. And then we just have to hold that. But it's sitting in a place, of, you know, part of the world that is on the verge of being balkanized. Kurdistan just had a vote. There may be an independent Kurdistan out of Iraq. Syria will be balkanized. It most certainly will. Um, Post-Assad, whatever that looks like, but Syria is going to be cut apart. Russia will have a big presence in there. So I, I don't know. The, the delivery simply is by multiple means, and primary among those is a network of an alliance, a grouping of alliances that agree and can commit and can take the risks associated with rounding up and eliminating those pockets that haven't been converted. I mean, that haven't been converted, that they're, this isn't the right way to go. And establishing, my view, is turning the lights on. If I can turn the lights on in the dark places of the world, that's going to overcome the dark. That would allow for, you know, and the only way you do that is not by killing a bunch of people. We have to do that through education. And it's an extremely long term, very, um, very expensive process. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you comment on And you got to get close to it. There you go. Hold it down. Um, can you uh, respond to how the new um, cybersecurity facility in Riyadh, um, Saudi Arabia, that was just you know started a few months ago? What role they could play in dealing with the um, all the cyber marketing that I that ISIS is doing, and at, at what level can we really trust them to the Saudis? give us the uh, true? Intelligence. Well, first of all, it's a um, it's not a cybersecurity facility. Uh, what was created was a joint U.S. Saudi. It's essentially a think tank with focus on all all those elements of power, which is a first in terms of cooperating and bringing in the best brains to address what are the potential solutions toward the thorniest problems in that part of the world. So, don't think of that as an NSA like facility that's doing collection and doing processing and then has a bunch of secrets that are going elsewhere. It's more a think tank. Um, the, the bigger concern that I have relative to Saudi Arabia is the House of Saud is very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But immediate and cataclysmic change can be very, very dangerous. I think we all would agree on that. So what does, what does Saudi Arabia look like post Saud, the House of Saud? And so there are a lot of freedoms and um, opportunities that don't exist now that will be very broadly available. I just used a small example of women can now drive cars in Saudi Arabia. That's a, that's a, that's a big deal. How many more of those will be in place instituted? And, and look, what was the example? Perestroika, 
right? What happens is we started changing our relationship with the former Soviet Union is Soviet Union collapsed. It started dropping down some of their own barriers and some of their own prohibitions. It collapsed. It collapsed. That could happen in Saudi Arabia. It might be a longer time period, but it, it could happen. Yes? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question going back to thinking about ISIS, and it's probably just crying over spilled milk. But from the first time I heard news reports about ISIS, I was saying, that's the most dangerous thing in the world today. Who is responding? Why did it take us, it seems to me, years before we ever really responded? That's a question that you would have to, that's not a military guy's response. It's a former administration's response. And I think the initial response was tepid. It's tepid. Um, there was so much more we could do and galvanize partners to assist. Do you know the sortie? Everybody know what a sortie is? That's an aircraft that's going to do a mission and comes back. It's a sortie. If it drops ordnance in two different places, it's still a sortie. It's a pilot or kind of a thing. Um, when we started our campaign against ISIS, we had maximum about six sorties a day. That's it. Remember what happened in 1999? We went to war against Serbia. Remember, Milosevic? We had an air campaign. I was on the ground in the Balkans when all that happened. So there was a lot of ground activity, but that air tasking order, the number of sorties were in the hundreds every day, Serbia. No more than six or seven, all of Syria. So we really could have suffocated ISIS from the outset and really disrupted their momentum. Uh, look, and I'm not an archaeologist, but look at the damage that, that they've done. It's shameful. Well, you know, it's, history. it's not history that's lost. It's just history that's now altered forever. But it's not spilled milk. It's a good analytical question. It's a good analytical question. Yes? Do you think that there's going to be civil war in Iraq over Kurdistan? Great question. I sure hope not. God, I hope not. Um, so the answer is no. Um, primarily because I, I think Iraq understands that there is, this, this is not a new discussion. This, this is a discussion that's been in place forever. Part of the challenge is it's not just the identity of being a Kurd, but it's also oil. Lots of money. Um, and, Kur and the Kurds would have that, and they'd have all those trading rights, and they, you know, all of a sudden, and the rest of Iraq is atrophying um, economically. And then if you were to separate, if the next step was to take a portion of Iraq where the Shias primarily live, which is down tucked in toward Iran on the southeastern portion, guess what's down there? Oil. The Sunnis are in... They get desert. They got no oil. Um, I, I certainly hope not. Um, I, and I, so I, I don't have a crystal ball. I know a lot of the people that are involved. Um, Barzani, I know. Um, these are reasonable people, but they also understand it's an opportunity for them. I hope there's a peaceful solution. I would ask the same question about Spain. Catalonia, yeah, I don't know. Um, yes. Yes, ma'am. That's, that's your mom, Pierre. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Throw, throw her a bone here, guys. Thank you. Push to talk. And you got to hold it. Oh, okay, I have one. Okay. I have a couple of questions. No, one. no. One question. All right. <laughs> one question. Okay. I grew I grew up in Egypt when I saw the rise of the uh, Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, and how they were able to gain the vote of the people. At the same time, I'm very interested in what happened to the Arab Spring, uh, which happened in uh, uh, Tunisia and then was squashed, squashed. But maybe this is where we should work with the people, tend them to really revolt by themselves, even though it poorly. Yes, ma'am. Great question. I got to tell you, the Arab Spring turned into an Arab nightmare. It really wasn't a spring. The only place it was successful was where it was 
first, it, you know, the, the, it germinated from Tunisia, and they've achieved a level of success. It has spun out of control elsewhere. Um, that's, you know, I got to tell you, I am not, I, I'm not here to tell you that uh, I think the only way that that's going to be successful, any type of an uprising has to have a catalyst. Far too often that catalyst doesn't include a description of what success looks like and the pathway to success. So you have this emotional outburst and it just doesn't go anywhere. Doesn't go anywhere. It's not viable. There aren't specific objectives. Um, what happened in Tunisia was unique. And I think where you have the catalyst for uh, a change is there has to be a, an acknowledgement on the part of those in power, those that have the, in governance, that the change, that there is, a, there's legitimacy to the people's complaint. How often do you see that in parts of the world where there is a routine, you know, kind of an imposition on the people. Doesn't happen very often. People kind of like what they're looking, I mean, look at Syria. It's disgusting what has occurred in Syria. And Assad still exists. He's more powerful now than he was because he's killed so many of his people. You know, the number one export in Syria is its people. Go to Thessaloniki in Greece. You know where Greece is right up here? Go to Thessaloniki, it's right on the Med. There are camps of 40,000 people waiting to, as we say in the military, onward movement into Europe. What a breeding ground of ter for terrorism, for challenges, for economic issues that are going to occur. Yeah, yes, sir. You haven't mentioned Iran. Yeah, Iran is a, ma a major concern, but our relationship with Iran is more than simply the, the joint comprehensive plan of action. It's what's called the JICPOA. It's an acronym. That's part of the test. Um, that's the nuke deal. That's what's called the nuke deal. Okay? So it's more than that. Our relationship with Iran has always been troubled in the last 40 years. Um, my brother-in-law is Iranian. Married to my bride's sister. He goes back to Tehran as a matter of routine. Um, the sad part about Tehran is that the people of Iran want to advance and move forward, yet the mullahs are holding them back, and the Revolutionary Guard is imposing restrictions on that. That's a, that's a, real, that's a real shame. That's where you would think maybe there'd be an opportunity for some type of a revolution. Well, they had one back in 79, and it went the other way, right? Um, do you know... My brother-in-law, who's been back to, goes to Tehran routinely, his dad lives there. Um, he said it's not unusual to walk down the street in Tehran and you see women that are walking down the street with bandages across their noses because they want you to think they had a nose job. <laughs> they want to be more Western. They want to be more attractive. They want to be more engaged. You're kidding me. Really? Very odd. Very odd. Sir, what are three and four? Say again? What are three and four? I, three and ISIS, what's three and four? You said there are four? There, there, I was going to talk about three. Okay. I can talk about 98. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Um, this is a record for this slide. You guys are setting record on this slide. <laughs> the, third, the third I would talk about is um, the EU. Um, my big concern about the EU is Merkel just, she won her election, but she's being challenged by what I would call the alt-right. Um, Macron, I think, thank goodness, won the election in France. Marine Le Pen would not have been good for France. Um, but, the number, but the number one concern remains safety, security. I have a very good friend of mine who's... Um, whose bride is a flight attendant for United Airlines. And she has been with United Airlines forever. This guy my age, great guy. So she gets the overseas trips. She's about to retire, so she chooses when and where she wants to travel. So every Friday she flies to Rome, and she flies back on Monday. She takes her hubby. 
pretty good deal. So I called him up. I said, what'd you have, on, what'd you have for dinner on Friday night? Where'd you go? You know, I went to the local Italian restaurant around the corner in Vienna, Virginia. And he went, oh, I went to this great place. It's by the Ponte Vecchio. And then we went to the Vatican. I said, okay, you need to be, you need to be quiet. I don't want to talk to you anymore. So he was in Rome just last weekend. And he called me. And he said, Spider, you should see the number of immigrants that are everywhere in Rome. It's not a bad thing, but it's an aimless mob of folks everywhere. A lot of people begging, a lot of people digging into your pocket, bugging you when you're trying to eat outside. He's going, what? this is crazy. Europe has got a challenge. Europe's got a problem. The Schengen Treaty, 1985, right? That dropped the barriers among and between countries. The Euro, 1999, common currency. Are those going to be revisited? There's a very good chance they will be revisited. And all of a sudden we start putting up barriers again. And there's legitimacy to having a barrier to make it a little more difficult for people to travel. You can travel from the Bosporus, you can travel from the Bosporus all the way to Calais and nobody checks your ID. You are kidding me. That's the world we're in, that's the Europe we've created. Okay, that's wonderful, it's open, it's great, it's transparent. And we got a bunch of problems. And we have people we can't afford. And taxes are going to go high. And medical expenses are going to go out the roof. So what do you do? Do you put up more barriers? The challenge that I have is that the United States of Europe is a far safer place than the divided states of Europe. And if all of a sudden we're back to divided states within Europe and wither the EU, every country is going to start cutting their own deals. And when they're unified, guess where they lean? They lean toward the United States. That's where their moral, their historical, their ethical underpinnings and their cultural draw is toward the United States. That's a good thing. A bad thing is everybody cutting their own deals. And guess who they're going to cut deals with? Russia and China. And now we have an inner war, World War I, World War II Europe. How did that turn out? That's my concern. That's my concern. But how do you solve the immediate problems? There are solutions. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know exactly what they all are. But I do know that Europe is struggling right now with its identity. Brexit may or may not have a significant impact. I don't know. Macron now is kind of emerging as the leader within Europe. Merkel is going to stand in his shadow probably going forward. I don't know if that's going to be a problem. That concerns me greatly. Yes, ma'am. Just, yeah, just hold it down. Yep. Oh, I got it. What kind of future do you see for the UK? What, what type of future do I see for the UK? Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's going to be a significant change in the UK um, with Brexit, without Brexit. You could have a new, new vote in Scotland. You could have a new vote for a separation of Scotland. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's centuries <laughs> in a struggle, obviously. Um, I think the United States and the UK will have an enduring relationship, which is to everybody's best, in everybody's best interest. I, I don't know if there's a magic answer to if there's going to be a major struggle in the UK. Sir. Uh, do you think that the United States is backing away from its role in global leadership? Um, and if so, what are the implications, especially given all the concerns that you've expressed so far? Yeah, I think the United States runs the risk of losing its position of prominence uh, internationally. I think uh, during the years of the previous administration, that occurred. And I think what we're seeing now is the pendulum is swinging far too dramatically in the other direction. So we end up having a, a major concern. We overcorrect. Uh, it's not unlike, um, you guys are from Indiana, you've driven in snow before. You hit a patch of ice and all of a sudden you overcorrect and what happens? You're doing, a, you're doing donuts and it's extremely dangerous. Well, we've overcorrected and we're doing donuts right now. We run the, we run the risk of unplugging internationally. Um, America's resilient, America's smart, our national security team is world class. 
Uh, these, are, these are gentlemen, these are ladies and gentlemen that you should trust and feel comfortable in terms of what they're doing on your behalf. These are great patriots. Um, they're smart, they're dedicated, uh, and they've been, I'll get to you in a sec, and they've been in the midst of this darkness and light problem for the last 20 plus years and then well before that as well. Um, so I, I do think America can lose its position of prominence. I do think we're gonna fight every day to make sure we don't. We'll have some internal struggles. Um, and, we, and I think we're mindful of the fact that the world is a better place when we're the lead dog. And that's not jingoism, that's a statement of fact. What, are you gonna follow the Botswana? And I know it's late, you guys are tired, but it's not, I'm not trying to be humorous. But I mean, who are you gonna, the Netherlands? You wanna follow the Netherlands? Have at it, great country, great ally, have at it. America leads and the world follows. That's what happens, statement of fact. Um, we can't afford to not have that capability in place. Um, yes, Mr. Yes, sir. Um, where would you say that, like, if there has been, like, already consequences of the U.S. moving away from its global leadership role, where would you say, like, you really first saw, like, a real consequence of that? And where do you think we might see consequences of that if we don't change our course? Yeah, um, Korea is one of those. We have a new president in Korea, President Moon, is very much in favor of trying to achieve some form of rapprochement with the North. Um, admirable, aspirational, not gonna happen. There's also his predecessor, President Kim Dae-jung, back in 1998 to 2001, 2002, the Sunshine Policy. Uh, I was there then. What a wonderful man, what an incredibly brilliant initiative on, our, on his part, and it went totally sideways, and it cost South Korea billions of dollars. And the North just took advantage of it. There's no reason to believe that that won't happen again. Um, when presidents, when international leaders speak, they do two things, they reassure and they deter. So in the same language, you wanna provide reassurance to your friends and allies, and you want to provide deterrence to your potential enemies. And you want guys that are on the fence to make up their mind and become friends because of what they heard. You can't have multiple messages, and that's my concern is that's what we have now. So Seoul is, is concerned, and they shouldn't be. Our alliance with Seoul is phenomenal. Japan is a little bit concerned. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Um, a number of our friends in NATO, when Russia took Crimea, were concerned. The United States breathed a sigh of relief when that happened because the Ukraine is not a member of NATO. They weren't forced to act. They could allow it to occur. Um, so in the, in the past eight months, I would say the primary challenge that we've had has been in that part of the world, that part of the world. Um, let me move, I've also been asked, and I, I don't have to do this, but let me talk to you about, so what do you do in this type of world? My mom was from West Texas, great lady. I have no clue whether I'm on time or off time, but if there's beer out there, we could, it'll be a good thing. But, um, five minutes. My mom was from West Texas, wonderful, wonderful gal. Dirt poor, the only thing, all sisters, um, so I had all these Texas women beating the crap out of me when I was a kid. They all were wonderful and they were all educated. The only thing they had, they had no money, but they had education, which is really very cool. Um, so my mother had this expression, when you see a thistle, grasp it firmly. I had no idea what that ever meant. And her point was, look, when you live in West Texas, you have thistle that will grow in the yard. And if you don't get the thistle out of the yard, it will overtake your yard. You won't have any grass at all. So you gotta get the thistle out of there. And there's no easy way to get a thistle out of there. You gotta grab it, you're gonna cry, you pull it out. I always had this thistle conversation with my mom and I'd go to my, my brother and my sister, I'd go, mom gave me the thistle thing. What does that mean again? I wanna make sure I'm doing the right thing. So, leadership in today's world is all about grasping the thistle. It, it, there's, you know, I kinda sound like Debbie Downer. You look at that map of the world, you go wah, wah, you know? It's all this bad news. That's the world we're a part of. 
There's lots of light. Be encouraged by the light. And let's put more light where it's dark. So what type of leader do you want to be? So my question about leadership, I'm going to go real quickly through this. When you sign your name, what follows your name? Your title. Your what? Not your who. Your who is far more important than your what. And I got to tell you, as you move through life, don't lose sight of your who. Who you are. Not what you do. People may care about what you do. It's who you are. What type of a person are you? Do you have values and are they aligned? Professional, personal values. Who in this room has values? Every, every hand should go up. Okay? I'm going to ask on a couple of folks. What are your values? A lot of property ownership. Why would I disagree with your values? Okay. No, but at, what are your values? So honesty, integrity, you don't want to share them, okay? Who wants to share their values? I'll share mine. Yes, sir. Family. Family. Great value. Your values, faith. Service. Service. Loyalty to your family, to whatever your God is, or your whatever you, whoever you, inspirationally grabs you. Respect, respect of others. So I can't understand why you don't want to share your values. Because they're not controversial. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a host of values. If you know what your values are, and that's exactly my point, if you know what your values are, you better share them. If you're keeping your values a secret, I hope you're living your values, and, and if you don't talk about them, they'll at least see your behavior. But you need to share your values. People around you need to know what your values are. And you can demonstrate those 24-7, the type of person you are. And they need to be aligned with what you do in the office, or what you do at home, or what you do on the sports team, or what you do in church. How difficult is it if you have a bunch of values for my work, and I got a bunch of values for my home life, I got a bunch of values in the classroom. Keep it easy on yourself. In a world that's super complicated, a VUCA world, simplify it. Have your values, know what they are, keep them aligned. And then you have a philosophy of leadership. Whether you're leading yourself, you know, the first person you have to lead is yourself. And leadership's all about the lead. It's not about you. You're an effective leader because the organization that you're leading achieves goals and objectives that they want to achieve. Because you want them to achieve it and because they want to achieve it. So thing called buy-in. My leadership philosophy, you know, I don't know if it was Lincoln or if it was one of the founding fathers or I don't know who it's attributable to, but if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Over the course of 40 plus years in my life as a professional, 45 years as a professional, I've got my leadership philosophy down to four letters, tips. Talk with your people, keep them informed, be predictable as a leader, and be sensitive to their needs. There are a thousand other things I could talk about. Tips works for me. Tips works for me. Let me go to the next one. Now I have two minutes. Okay? Okay? Some final thoughts. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, one thing I, I tell folks all the time is that, you know, look, I, I spent my life in uniform. I got it. So you're either on duty or off duty. I used to tell folks you're never off duty. Your people are watching you all the time. Right? You know, is your private face your public face? I hope so. You're never really off duty. Consider that. And if you've got values that are aligned, it really doesn't matter. Um, I always talk about, people always talk about get out of the box. You're not creative enough. You're not innovative enough. Get out of the box. That's crazy. The box is defined by your boss. If I'm out of the box, I'm doing something my boss hasn't endorsed, which means I'm at risk, and he or she's going to slam me if something goes sideways. That's a crappy boss, but that happens. Go to your boss and say, build me a bigger box. I want to do some extra things. Don't put my boundary here. Put my boundary over here. Spend time trying to innovate. Look, I think creativity tends, I, again, simplifying this, I'm not very creative, but I'm pretty innovative. In other words, I can see good ideas being generated, and I want to try to innovate those and get them together and get them moving. So I don't, I played the piano as a kid and I was terrible. My art was always stick figures. 
I'm not very creative, but I love being around people who are creative. Magic occurs, because I'll be their advocate. I'll help them build a bigger box, at least I hope I can. And then, boom, okay? On my bedside table is the prince, Machiavelli. It's not about being a crazy person and being hard on folks. There are, there are some timeless verities within the prince that I think are completely forgotten. Completely forgotten. The isolation of leadership. Hey, when you're a leader, it's pretty tough. You know, a thousand people are going to tell you what you're doing wrong. You're in charge. Get buy-in. Share your thoughts. The inevitability of decision. You're going to have to walk down the path and make a decision, and not everybody's going to love it. And because they don't like the decision, they're not going to like you. It's now personal. Just brush it off. Let it happen. The inequality of ideas. You know, not everybody gets a trophy. But everybody gets a trophy today, right? Everybody gets a trophy. Crazy. Hey, some ideas are really good. Some ideas are kind of terrible. And guess what? You're not a very good second baseman. You're not getting a trophy. Okay? You, you swung and you missed every time you got to the plate. You never got a ground ball. You showed up, you had a juice box and a bunch of oranges. You're getting a trophy. No, you're not. Okay? Dismissed flattery. How many times have you had somebody who you either worked for or was on your team and they kept saying, hey, how am I doing? How am I doing? Boss, your stomach's really flat, your jaw's really square. You're such a wonderful person. You're kidding me, right? Eliminate, don't worry about flattery. It doesn't lend itself to any conclusion. Um, and then I always kind of think about, are you a wind chime? What's the purpose of a wind chime? It makes noise, and how often do you hear the noise and you don't pay attention to it? Then all of a sudden it's yelling at you, going, I wish I'd paid attention. So there's a purpose to the wind chime. We often don't pay attention until it's a category five. It's okay to be a wind chime. It's okay to be a wind chime. Don't be the wind chime that is routinely chirping or chatting and nobody, you know what I mean? Make sure your engagements have purpose to them so that you can avoid that because there is value to providing your thoughts. Folks, you've been very, very uh, gracious with your time, and I want to tell you how much I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you.